face. What room? Third. Welcome back to Third Phase of Moon. My name is Blake Cousins, and we have a special guest back due to popular demand. Michael Horn, the representative of Billy Meyer, incredible case. Michael, welcome to Third Phase of Moon. Well, Michael's joining us via Skype live from Arizona, and we're talking to him at home base, third phase moon right here in Hawaii. This is going to be an incredible uh, interview, and we want to get started with what's going on. New revelations, new insight to photographs, videos, and even people covering up the information. Let's get straight to the cover-up. What's going on with you trying to get the information out on Billy, and now all of a sudden, People are trying to close it down, not getting the word out. Tell us what's going on, Michael. It's actually very interesting. I put out a new film just a little less than a month ago called And Did They Listen? And I submitted the film to one of the uh, administrators at Arizona State University because I thought it might be a nice place to screen the film for a few reasons. One, of course, for students and professors alike to see it and to question and challenge. And two, there's a professor named Paul Davies at that university who's written five books on extraterrestrial life, but who's run away totally from even looking at the Meyer material. It probably would ruin his career a little bit. Okay, so I submit the film. Nice lady says, okay, I'll, I'll watch your film. And then she writes me back and she says, your film will not be shown or sponsored by anyone at ASU. What she said is, we're banning this film. We're censoring this film. Now, folks, you know that all sorts of things go down on colleges. That same college has some kind of a crazy class about uh, using condoms. I mean, quite literally, I've got some of blog. It's hysterical stuff. But she was so intimidated by seeing this film. She watched it over a weekend's time. She could not criticize one thing, but it's so obviously busted up her belief system that she has taken the step to ban the film. Well, let's, uh, Michael, let's let's share with everybody right now this uh, this new documentary that you're going to be releasing, or it's released right now. But everybody at Third Phase, I mean, let's take a look at it right now, and we'll be right back. It was a time when the people had created great turmoil environmental catastrophes and wars on their once beautiful planet. They thought of themselves as the only intelligent beings and the crowning glory of creation. There are more advanced human beings than we are, and they're actually in contact with one man on Earth. Clearly, I mean, we would have to say, this is the most important thing that's ever happened. The core of this case, again, is a spiritual teaching, not a belief system and not a religion, a teaching about human consciousness and all these things. The Menschen müssen lernen, sich selbst zu sein, und müssen die Selbstverantwortung zu tragen lernen. Fukushima, Meyer was told within mere days, this is already a super worst possible case scenario, which will only get worse. You are being lied to, and the contamination of your seas and your air, your food chain, is going to be exponential. Okay, we're back. Now, Michael, why do you think they're banning this film? What's, what's so relevant that they don't want to get the information out to the public? Here's the deal. This film, you know, this is like my third film in, in six years or whatever on the Meyer case. It is inescapably, inescapably real. When you watch the film, we lay out so many things over 111 minutes that anybody can check out. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about the amazing wedding cake UFO that's been analyzed. The prophecies, scientific information, it's so solid that anybody, A, that has a strong religious belief system, is probably going to go a little wacky. Anybody that has only been looking at UFOs for the phenomenon part, you know, let's be honest, the, the stuff that we can see on film, but we don't know if they're there, why are they there? 
This film lays out the reason, what it's about for us as humanity, what we need to learn because of what is already coming down the pipe and that which is already obviously upon us and what's coming. People don't want to know. They want to, you know, preoccupy themselves with trendy and I think oftentimes irrelevant things. College students are inheriting this world. High school students are inheriting it. And this woman, who's a very, very nice person, I spoke her, but it obviously blew her up because you can't criticize. You can't, it's not about little aliens with big heads and big eyes. It's about real human beings who are highly advanced, who for 70 years have been meeting with Meyer, met with him as, as recently as two weeks ago. I happen to know that. And, and they continue to give him information and to keep a hands-off policy on this, it's up to us now. If, if this cottage wants to ban it, it's like trying to pull the covers over your head. It doesn't make it go away. Well, Michael, when uh, we first spoke to you, almost about a, about six, seven months ago, we were uh, happy enough and honored to share the Billy Meyer story, and the response was huge. I remember as a young child myself, watching Billy Meyer and seeing these fantastic stories and more and more the evidence comes in. You know, people from around the world will say it's a controversial, very controversial uh, story. The evidence is there. People judge judge it with what they will, but the audience members that here at Third Phase Moon just reacted to it so uh, much in a big time way. That's why we're back here talking about this again. And I, I want to get to some of the questions that people have come to us and wanted to ask you. And first of all, what this is about regarding this photograph, the wedding cake at night, this golden wedding cake shot. Now it's been enhanced and people want to know what's up. What, what are we seeing after this enhancement decades later? Well, this is interesting for two reasons. I'll back it up before the enhancement and say to you, there's an arrow on this one photograph and it's pointing to a band that we can see here. I found out uh, about three, four, five years ago, I noticed that the the dimensions on this craft changed from the daytime craft. You can see photographs of you know the broad daylight one parking in front of Meyer's house and this nighttime one. The the top of it, we could call it a cupola, extends out of the craft. And this is something that then Professor Zaki also noticed and analyzed. But the real meat of the matter when we look at this wedding cake thing here, and I am a zero of technology. I put it in Photoshop. I did exactly what he said. Turn up the contrast, turn up the brightness. And 32, 33 years later, we see that this is not a model against a black curtain. This is a really large object hovering over a road at night with a post, could be a fence post or a, a marking post that they have for, you know, so many meters or whatever in Switzerland. Meyer is sitting on another craft above this craft when he takes this photograph. He told people, and the beauty of this is Meyer, he's known for 32, 33 years. Hey, I took that night, we we're hovering over a road. He's never said a word. We have to find the stuff for ourselves. And this makes all the skeptics look like monkey brains. Oh, it's a garbage can that they said with Christmas tree ornaments and all this nonsense. Obviously, this is no garbage can lid. And in his third analysis of it, which is, you know, you might be able to show that or link to it, he shows the most discreet details on this thing. There are crystals that are red, that are green, that are blue, that are white. There's the skeptics said, oh, there's something that fell off. And what, you know, they were saying a piece of it fell off and sitting in the daytime. But it's not, it's a ring that's actually part of the construction. When you zoom in on the globes, these have lenses in them, like blue lenses. This is mind boggling. I don't care about any, you, know, you can look at a lot of great footage. I understand it's fascinating. This thing, Meyer is within 20, 30 feet of it. Well, you know, the pictures, I was looking at them today and we're sharing them right now. And I suggest everybody take a look at the, the photo, the nighttime photo, do your own investigation, put some brightness contrast on it, watch when it pops and you'll see what Billy said all along, it basically it appears that there's a, a floating major major uh, wedding cake kind of flying saucer above a post and kind of like a field. Quite interesting, 30 years later, this was revealed. 
And now we're, look, we're looking at, go ahead. No, I was going to say, we would, the skeptics who are obviously going to lose their screws over this, and they have, they, can, they cannot respond. They refuse to now even engage. Here's the thought. We would have to believe that Billy Meyer, 33 years ago, is somehow smart enough with a 35 millimeter film camera to take a nighttime photo, knowing somehow he's going to be able to trick 21st century state-of-the-art technology and voila, we're gonna see this craft is hovering over a road. It doesn't happen, folks. He, this is one of 63 photos. And when you look at the video that's freely available on my site and through YouTube, five minutes of zooming in and out of the wedding cake ship broad daylight. This is real. And he meets with these folks, but they're human beings. They're, they're not, there's no extraterrestrial presence walking around on Earth, with the exception of when these folks drop down on him once every few weeks, meet with him, talk to him, and he types out the contact, and then they're gone. There's no extraterrestrials working underground. There's, I mean, all of this stuff that we've been told is the disinformation, and it's come from the UFO industry and the UFO community. Fine, let's look at everything. Let's see what we can learn from it. But people, the clock is ticking. These people have given us information to help us survive what's coming down the pike. Well, we just looked, uh, as you're saying that, at some of these detailed photos, close up of the, you know, people claim it's some kind of model or something like that. But, you know, 30 years ago, this was, if it was a model manufactured 30 years ago, the detail that uh, we're looking at here is why go out of their way to do it. It, it is quite interesting. The detail is spectacular and the technique on whatever it is, it seems extraterrestrial in origin. Now let's get to these photographs. I love these, these broad daylight photographs of uh, the saucer, like basically hovering around this tree. And this is one of the most amazing uh, metallic broad daylight photos out there. Pretty much the most controversial shots. Tell us about these and what was Billy Meyer uh, when he's taking these shots? What do you, what was he thinking? Was the wedding cake or was speaking about yes. oh. The wedding cake next to the tree, broad daylight. Go ahead. Right. And they are truly amazing photographs. He took them at various ranges of distance. When you do look at the video, you'll see him actually snapping some of the photos in that five minute video that's you know for free on, uh, on my website. He is, he actually has a little conversation during the video. He's talking to one of the ETs, asking him to move the craft. And the guy says to him, no, because they always stop short of proving so that it's okay, it's a slam dunk. You know, I sent you another link showing the UFO going around the tree of film. That's been out there now for 40, 49 years or something crazy, 39 years, whatever it is. And the, the weird part is the craft is in two places in one frame of film. There's no models involved. So to get back to the wedding cake ship, this is a craft that the play are and basically actually made just for using in our, the contacts here on earth. And they actually had to take it out of operation because the metals started to, to have corrosion from our atmosphere. But we got 63 photos and a great video out of them. And of course, everybody, you know, thought, oh, this is, as we said, it's got to be some kind of a hoax. Those detailed photographs that you show, you show those crystals, there's like a hundred red crystals around. I mean, here's a one-armed guy who's even going to sit around and try to place crystals on a, on a garbage can lid. The guy who did the best model of this couldn't even come close with the details. So we... Terrestrial technology made by human beings who are way ahead of us. And they're not wanting us to focus too long on this, but they want to get our attention. So I think, to answer your question, a lot of it is about getting our attention so we'll pay attention then to the information. Well, let's take a, a quick clip, a uh, quick view of uh, this documentary that appeared right here in Third Phase of Moon, uh, thanks to Michael Horn. Let's take a look at it right now. Das Universum, das ist schon, uh... The universe is already very, very old, and everything took its time to come into being, even human life. The beginning is the cause from which the effect came about. 
It's the law of causality which has to take effect. The meaning of life is the human being's evolution with regard to his consciousness. Billy, what is God? God is an imaginary figure which has been created by human beings so they don't have to bear responsibility themselves. Rather, they can shift it onto a deity, but God in and of itself is nothing other than a title for a human being who is very highly evolved. God is therefore not what human beings wrongly assume, that he is the creator, the creator of life, the creator of a universe, of space. God is nothing other than a title, be it Allah or Shiva, etc. The human being always tries to set a power above himself and he calls it God. This God or this power is supposed to be responsible for him and everything and anything that he says, does, thinks and feels and so forth and for his fate. The human being is solely responsible for each and everything he thinks, does, feels and undertakes. He must be responsible for it. He must bear and savor all the positive and negative which he processes through his thoughts, actions and feelings. Special effect artists that worked on the movie Independence Day, you reached out to them to, uh, you know, share Billy Meyer's evidence. What became of that and what did they have to say? Tell us about the whole experience. Go ahead. Yes, um, it was a time that I was uh, making, pardon me, making the Cyber Revolution true and uh, my friend, uh, one of my friends knew them and brought me to see them. They were, I think, at the time in Culver City. They're called Uncharted Territory. Uh, Volker, Engel, and, and Mark, and the name is, last name is escaping me at the moment. It's been probably about seven, eight years, whatever. Anyhow, um, they commented on this film uh, that Meyer took, the first film that Meyer took in 1975, where the UFO is going around the tree. Now, many people said, oh, it's obviously a model on the string. It, it got known as the pendulum UFO, too, for a while. And so people attacked that as an obvious host. and skeptic, set up a miniature tree, and he, you know, did a thing with a little model. It didn't do a bad job, but what just happened in the last couple of months is Professor Zagni, who did all of the analysis on the wedding cake ship, decided to go over that film book. And his findings actually validate what the effects guy said years ago. To really do that shot right and to fake it, you would need a crane and wires and all sorts of things pulling. And because it's not just an object that is dangling and spins around, Professor Zaghi showed, and of course it's linked from my blog, that the, the craft was behaving in very specific and unusual ways that completely eliminated the possibility of any string. The string would have had to have been shortened, lengthened, the focal point would have had to have moved, all sorts of stuff. Most amazingly, it appears that in uh, a couple of times in one frame of the film, you can see the craft in, in about two places in one frame of the film, somehow. And I, I think anybody that wants to, again, do what Professor Zahi did, he tells you what equipment he used, and you can, take the film clip and, and analyze it. That isn't my specialty. And uh, of course, I'm really kind of tickled, if you will, that the two guys that own that company, the Academy Award winning company, got it right. It's not, it's not just dang a little long. You would really need a crane and you'd have to manipulate because of the way the thing turns, and wobbles and backs up. So what we see at first glance, what we appear to see, this is always what's really happening, what's really there. And that's what's so amazing about Meyer's evidence. There's a, a lot of these pictures and photographs and videos, it shows that this uh, metallic disc, you know, loves to hang out around trees. Is there a reason behind that, did Billy say? You know, what he said, as I recall, he said, you know, they wanted to just have the photos and films near objects that people could have a 
relationship to size-wise. They could tell, um, you know, how big this other object, the craft, would be because these would be known objects. Now, of course, people tried to jump on and say, oh, those are miniature trees. But years ago, forestry experts were given the photographs and they said, we don't know what the, the object is, but those are mature, real 40-foot trees. How do you know that? Well, there's something called nesting that takes place uh, at the tops of some of these trees. There's pruning marks or branches have been cut off. There's little details that just do not show up on models because basically a model tree is made to look quote unquote good. And these guys said right away, oh no, it's a real tree. It's full size, look at here. This is, so that worked, except the skeptics kept on yammering about it's got to be models. I have a link, and maybe we'll be showing that tonight, where uh, there's a video, and Meyer and a Japanese film director walk up the hill to where the tree is, with the most famous one of them, of the shots, called the, the, the Sunshine UFO photo. And you'll see the photo, and then you'll see them walk up to that tree. It's a different season. It's clearly the same tree. It's a huge tree. And so there's no way that some little model could have been put up there, you know. This just takes common sense, patience, looking, thinking, and then you get someone like Professor Zaghi, who starts ripping through these things with real state-of-the-art technology. And, and you know, he's got those videos he made on the analysis of the way the ink craft. This, this is just putting it in a whole other realm. And all the years that it's taken for this to come forward, this is telling us that we're not as swift as we think we are. We don't always know. That's why I titled my article, Can You See What You're Looking At? Well, it's quite interesting. People become experts in things that they uh, don't understand overnight. And that's uh, a situation we have to deal with at Third Phase Moon all the time. There's these metallic disc videos that we receive on a you know, monthly basis of really good, great UFO video. And sometimes they have this pendulum effect or like a wobbly uh, action going on. But in, you know, Bob Lazar, he apparently worked at Area 51 and a lot of scientists that we've spoken to in quantum physics and all this, that they say when, when there's anti-gravity in that kind of state and it's in a hovering state, that's a kind of a natural reaction. It's when they get to uh, great speeds is when they start to stabilize. That's what they're all about. The design is about high-speed travel. And then, right. uh, go ahead. Well, a, a lot of what is being seen and filmed and, uh, and photographed is not extraterrestrial. There are a number of terrestrial groups that have advanced craft. They're not interplanetary, but some of it is anti-gravity. And some of the stuff has existed for decades. This is where people that you know are only going to focus on the phenomena are not going to get their bang for the buck. You can only go so, so far with stuff that flies around. The Meyer case gives us the reason for contact. And I wouldn't care if there were 30 or 300 other genuine authentic contactees. They simply aren't. They can't prove it. Lots of good footage nowadays because there's lots of testing of military craft and there is an extraterrestrial race whose craft are sometimes seen around the world and photographed and who are not the player and they are a race that's only observing us at this time, they're not contacting. All right, Michael, you know, everybody wants to know when, if ever, are we ever gonna get to speak with, you know, Billy Myers? Well, you know, Billy just turned 77 I'm a little younger than he is, but he speaks mainly German, very little English now. Even when I go over there, I have to bone up with my almost non-existent German to talk to him. He gives me a break when I run out of words. <laughs> you know, he'll speak to me a little in English, but he does no more interviews. He's let us come over to film him. We have another shorter film that'll be coming out in a couple of months where he answers questions about the spiritual teaching. It's very interesting. And we, of course, have a couple clips in this film and in another film I have out. But his attitude is, look, I've written 26,000 plus pages of information. If we could sit down and have a conversation together, 
we won't learn as much in an hour with him as we can if we just sit there and voraciously go through the material. Think about it, question it. That's the way it is with, with good information. It's why you can go to a college and you get a lecture or something, but you've got those books. You see what I'm saying? So, sure, it's great to talk to Billy, but he's just, really, being with him is just like being with another guy. The difference is that maybe 15 minutes or 20 minutes before I sat down to talk to him, he's had a meeting with some of the extraterrestrial human beings, and they were doing work, and to them it's not a big deal, but they're not going to interact with us. So, what can I tell you? Is there any new message for anybody around the world listening right here at Third Phase Moon? What's the new message from Billy Meyer coming out? Well, the new message, there's some new information, but here, here's the plain, real truth. Within a week after Fukushima, and we go into this in the new film, and did they listen? Meyer was told that this was already an ultra, super, worst possible case scenario. The contamination already flowing out within the first several days had already reached Europe, the radioactivity. That's more than two and a half years ago. Fukushima is going to affect all of us for generations to come. We have to understand this is not going away simply because it isn't in today's news report, although it will, you know, it is somewhere. The BP disaster has contaminated the seas, and all of this stuff from both Fukushima and BP will down as rain. It will, it's already destroying the food chain. Parts of the oceans are dead. This is, you know, I don't mean to go into doom and gloom. My fire warned about this in 51, about this atomic power stuff, power plants, dangerous, bad, don't do it. He's been warning about environmental destruction since 51 or earlier. What he has said and been told recently is that by 2020, there's a very good chance that in the U.S. we will have anarchy here. Now, this is way out there kind of stuff. But let's remember that as early as 1981 and 87, he foretold two civil wars coming to America. We can see now the polarization, culturally, politically, racially, religiously, increases. People are under all sorts of increased stress. The financial situations are breaking down, and they will continue to break down. We've been warned about this stuff. So, do we just conclude this and say, well, it's doom and gloom and there's nothing we can do about it? No. He is still of a mind that there are things that each individual human being can do that can start to make course corrections to some degree. We're in these messes because human beings went in the wrong direction for too long. There's nobody coming to save us. There's no ascended masters. There's no angels. There's no gods. There's no group. It's not outside of us. This contact is about helping us to help ourselves assure our own future survival. We don't have to contract in fear and desperation. If anything, we should be accessing our own internal joy. We should be concentrating and meditating and looking to connect with other human beings who simply want to do those things to correct their thinking and their feelings and their actions towards peace, love, freedom, and harmony. It sounds simplistic, but who doesn't want those things? And look how far we are from it. Lots of stuff is coming. We just have to be, you know, that term spiritual warriors is probably an appropriate one. We buck up. We say, okay, we're in these times. They are interesting. They're challenging. Love, peace, freedom, harmony. If I maintain my focus on those things as much as I can. I vibrate that way. I start to correct myself. It radiates out. We link up with each other. And then we realize it's never been about UFOs.
Earth. It's never been about extraterrestrials. They've been through this. They had a world that was basically destroyed by atomic energy plants when they had things like meteorite strikes or earthquakes that ruptured those plants. They want us to go right to deep geothermal energy. You know, the Big Island has got plenty of that. And so does every place on Earth. You sink a shaft and you let that that heat energy come up into a facility with turbines and far more effective than solar, far more effective than wind. You can use those other things, but we don't need nuclear power plants to continue to poison. So there is so much here. Look, Michael, I really want to thank you for joining us right here at Third Phase of Moon, and we're going to have you back, and hopefully we could have the public and the Third Phase of Moon viewers ask you the questions, and uh, we'd hope to set this up and let everybody know about that. I'd love it. Thank you. All right, Michael, and if anybody out there has captured anything incredible, like Billy Meyer, hey, you can send it to Third Phase of Moon via Skype or Facebook, and also check out the link below and watch the full-length feature right here at Third Phase of Moon, the Billy Meyer uh, story, full insight. Check the link, and I'm sure you'll be amazed. Everybody, keep your eyes on the skies. My name's Blake Cousins, and we'll see you again next time. Third.